Hi everyone, welcome back to Mat A35. We're going to be talking about compartmental models today, so we're going to go back into Applied Land for a little bit. Um, so, let's go ahead and get started with a simple word problem. Uh, this is a, if you're following along in the book, this is the word problem on page 559. This is example 7 of your textbook. Um, so, suppose you have a tank uh, who's with 100 gallons of brine, so brine is just salt water, uh, with a concentration of 2.5 gallons of, uh, uh, sorry, 2.5 pounds of salt per gallon. So we have a tank, uh, and we have um, 100 gallons of brine. And let's call S of T the amount of salt that's currently in this tank. So right now it's going to be um, 250 pounds, but of course over time we're going to do stuff to this tank and the amount of salt in the tank is going to change. So what we're going to do is we're going to run brine containing 2 pounds of salt uh, per gallon into the tank at the rate of 5 gallons per minute. And we're going to have brine in the tank is going to run out at the rate of 5 gallons per minute. Um, and we're going to assume that the brine that's running out of the tank, that the tank is perfectly mixed. So the tank is constantly mixing so that the brine going out of the tank has uh, S over T uh, divided by 100 pounds per gallon of salt in terms of concentration. So now the question, oh, sorry, wrong way. The question here is, how does the amount of salt, S of T, in the tank change over time? So now this is a word problem, and we're going to have to figure out a couple different things, including how quickly salt goes into the tank, as well as how quickly salt leaves the tank. And these are, of course, all concentrations, so you have to divide by the amount of um, liquid that's, uh, multiply by the amount of liquid that's going by the concentration. So let's try doing this. So uh, we're going to have um, how much salt is being added to the tank. Well, uh, let me do this in black. So we have five gallons per minute and two pounds uh, per gallon, so that means uh, if we multiply those two together, we get 10 pounds per minute of salt uh, added to tank. And how much salt is leaving the tank? Well, we do the same thing, and so we multiply these two numbers together, and so then you end up with S of T divided by 20 pounds per minute of salt add it to the tank. Okay, so now combining these things together, these are both rates, right? So these are pounds per minute. And so you can think of this as the time derivative of uh, S. Uh, so we have uh, the S, the T, uh, which we're going to be using the dot notation for a lot of today's lecture. So this is going to be S dot. Oh, how did we get S of T? Uh, very good question. Uh, so, if we look at this diagram, the, we're calling the amount of salt in the tank S of T. And so, the second, this uh, second thing down here, this pipe is how much, um, what is being removed from the tank. So every minute you're removing five gallons of the tank, and you're assuming it's perfectly mixed, and so the amount of, uh, the concentration of salt in the tank is S of T divided by 100 here, um, and then what you're doing is you're saying, well, if I have S of T over 100 pounds per gallon, and we're moving at 5 gallons per minute, you end up with S of T divided by 20 pounds per minute uh, of salt being removed from the tank. Uh, S of T is just defined as the current amount of salt. We don't know how much it is. We know that S of 0 is equal to 250 pounds, but we don't know, how um, but we don't know what uh, anything more than that. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So, we're, what we're going to try to figure, we're, the way we're going to do this is going to, we're going to measure the rate of change of salt in the tank. And of course, that's just going to be, we add 10 pounds uh, per minute, and we subtract out S over 20 pounds, pounds per minute. And this gives us a differential equation, uh, this thing here. And all we have to do is we just need to solve this differential equation, and that will tell us how much salt is in the tank uh, as a function of time. Uh, any questions? So basically what we've done is we've turned this word problem into a differential equation. And now, this is a first order linear differential equation, and so we know how to solve this. So how do we solve this? Well, let's rewrite it in our canonical form. Uh, so our standard form is s dot plus 
1 over 20 times s is equal to 10. Okay, and of course this is a linear first order ODE. And here we have, this is p of x, uh, sorry, p of t, since we're using time here instead of uh, p of x. Uh, and we have q of t. Okay, so uh, be careful, we're using the variable t now instead of the variable x. Um, this is because for many of these applied problems, we actually do care about time, and so it's just easier to use the variable t instead of the variable x. Okay, so now we can multiply both sides by dt. Uh, and so like ends up getting ds plus dt times 1 over 20 uh, times s is equal to 10 dt. And this is, of course, because s dot is equal to ds uh, dt. Okay, and so now uh, what we can do is we know how, what integrating factor we need to turn the left-hand side into an exact differential. And so then... Uh, we know uh, i of t, our integrating factor, is going to be e to the integral of 1 over 20 dt, which is just equal to e to the uh, t over 20. And this is our integrating factor. Uh, and once we have this integrating factor, um, we multiply by the integrating factor on both sides, so you get e to the t over 20 times ds plus dt times 1 over 20 times s is equal to the, uh, oh, I don't have any integrals yet, uh, is equal to 10, uh, wait a moment, what did I just do wrong? Yeah, no, that's right, 10 e to the t over 20 dt. Now, of course, now we integrate both sides. And the left-hand side is an exact differential. In fact, from the algorithm that we described for solving linear first-order differential equations, we know that the left-hand side is exactly e to the t over 20 um, times s. And this is equal to, when you integrate this, what we get is 200 e to the t over 20 uh, plus c. And if we divide out by e to the t over 20 on both sides, that implies that s is equal to 200 plus some constant times e to the minus t over 20. Okay, and let's multiply by e to the minus t over 20 on both sides. Okay, and so that gives us a general solution. And of course, uh, there is also a formula for a, the solution for a linear first order ODE that we gave you in uh, last um, on, on Wednesday's lecture. Uh, and so you could just apply that formula. I find it more useful to use this integrating factor technique since it's more general, but both of those will work. So because it's a linear first order ODE, we can solve it, and we know the general solution for the amount of salt in the tank as a function of time. Now, of course, uh, this is a general solution, and in order to find a specific solution, we need to uh, solve the initial value problem. So the initial value problem here is just s is equal to 200 plus c some constant times e to the minus t over 20, and s of 0 is equal to 250. And so in order to solve this, what we do is we just take uh, 250 is equal to s of 0. If you plug in 0 into the equation on the right-hand side, you end up getting equal to 200 c e to the 0, and e to the 0 is just 1, so this is, oh sorry, uh, there's a plus sign there, and so this is just equal to 200 plus c. Well, we can solve for this, and so c is equal to 50, and therefore for s is equal to 200 plus 50 e to the minus t over 20, um, and therefore uh, salt concentration Uh, oh, not, not concentration, salt amount, amount in tank is 200 plus 50 e to the minus t over 20 uh, pounds uh, at a particular time. 
Okay, so let me ask you another question. Uh, what is the amount of salt in the tank on long time scales? So we have the explicit solution here, so we should be able to figure it out. So the question is, as time goes to infinity, how much salt is left in the tank? Or how much salt is in the tank? You're constantly adding some amount of salt and you're constantly removing some amount of salt. Okay, so, uh, yep, it looks like uh, people are replying C. So 200. Uh, this is correct. Um, uh, and you have to be careful. So this is amount of salt, not a rate. And so when, remember, when we did the integration, even though our units were originally in terms of pounds per minute, you're integrating over time, and so you end up with just an amount. And so the amount of salt in the tank uh, is actually just going to be 200 pounds. So the answer here is C. There's actually another way of seeing this, which uh, um, relies on the sort of analysis we did uh, for equilibria last time. So remember, uh, we can find... Uh, if we have an equation, let's say uh, s dot is equal to 10 minus s over 20. Well, let me do this in red, actually. So s dot is equal to 10 minus s over 20. Well, another way of solving it is to solve for the um, equilibria. So uh, 10 minus s over 20 is equal to 0 implies s is equal to 200 is the equilibrium. And now the next thing we need to do is we need to figure out whether this is a um, asymptotic stable equilibrium or an unstable equilibrium. Well, this is pretty easy to do because when you graph out, uh, let's say this is the 200 point. Oh, oops. Let's say this is the 200 point. Uh, when you graph this out, you end up with something that looks, oh, uh, if only I could draw a straight line. Life would be so much easier as a mathematician. So you end up with a line that looks like that, and from our phase line analysis, we know that below 200 it's going to go up, and above 200 it's going to go down. We actually end up starting somewhere around here, so 250. And so therefore, as time goes to infinity, this is an asymptotically stable, uh, asymptotically stable equilibrium. Okay, so those are both ways of figuring out. One is you could actually explicitly solve it. In this particular case, you could also figure it out just by looking for the equilibria and doing a phase line analysis. Any questions on that? Okay, so this is how we would generally solve this kind of word problem. It turns out that this kind of problem where you have something going in and something going out is a fairly general thing. And often we represent these things in a compartmental diagram. So let's go back to the original word problem, which has all these details. One way of abstracting this is uh, just to draw, well, boxes instead of complicated tank-like structures. Uh, so we have a box here for S, uh, and then our input into this box is 10, and our output is S over 20. So this is what we call a compartmental model of, a, of the system. So we have a variable s in the middle, and then we have the input, the, the stuff that's coming into s. So s dot is increasing by 10, uh, and s dot is de uh, uh, s dot means that s is increasing by 10, and uh, it's decreasing by s over 20 uh, per unit time. And this is a general thing we can do. So if we have uh, the, these are what we're, we we call compartmental models. So boxes represent variables. Uh, let me draw an, so. For example, uh, we might have some variable here, which is s. Uh, in fact, um, this is not so interesting for a single compartment, but maybe we have two compartments. So maybe we have two variables. We have s and i. Uh, and then arrows give rates of change. So an arrow pointing to a box increases that variable. So for example, this box that uh, increases by 10. And let's say we had another arrow pointing from here to here of 0.15. Uh, 
Oh, sorry, not 0 0.15, 0 0.1s. Okay, so that would mean that s is uh, decreasing by 0.1s and i is increasing by 0.1s. And let's go ahead and draw a couple more arrows just to make this a little bit more complicated. Um, oh, sorry, an arrow pointing away from a box decreases that variable. Let's say this uh, is 0.2i, and let's say we have another arrow here for just 6. Okay, so when we write this uh, system of equations out, what we end up getting is this is a representation of s dot is equal to 10 minus 6 minus 0.1s plus 0.2i. And i dot is equal to 0.1s minus 0.2i. Okay, and this is a system of ODEs of 2. ODEs that are dependent on each other. And we'll be uh, learning how to solve these kinds of things later. So we won't explicitly solve these kinds of complicated systems of ODEs until probably next week, maybe the week after. But the basic idea is you can draw these diagrams. And so often these diagrams represent different uh, objects in real life. So maybe you have water flowing from one tank to another uh, at different rates and you, you want to ask what the concentrations of some compound in the water are uh, over time. Or maybe uh, another very common and topical model is uh, SIR epidemics. So consider a simple epidemic model with three classes of people. Oh, can you explain how you got S dot and I dot? Yes, I can. So thank you for the question. So the basic idea here is these boxes represent variables, but the arrows represent rates of change, right? So what we're saying here is that uh, s is increasing by 10 because of this arrow uh, as a function of time. So that means we get uh, this s dot, so that would mean that s dot uh, uh, has a uh, 10, uh, this 10 here, because it's a rate of change. So all the arrows represent uh, what how s dot changes. So the arrows going in and out of s um, correspond precisely to s dot. Does that answer your question? So we have this, uh, uh, let me actually highlight a couple of them. So we have this red, uh, this 10 here, which is this 10. We have this, uh, I'm going to run out of colors. We have this 6 here. So that's uh, a 6 quantity of whatever is being removed from, this, from the box S. Uh, and then we also have, let's say, this thing here. So minus 0.1 S is being removed from S and being moved over to T as a function of time. Um, and let's say, and we have, we're also adding 0.2i to s from i. So this is just charting out the flow of different things in the system. And of course, flow is a function of time. And so uh, th these arrows represent flow rates, uh, and the boxes represent uh, how m uh, the variables themselves. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So uh, thanks for that clarification. Um, so now, uh, let's go back to this SIR epidemic model. So um, this is one of the classical models of epidemics. What you do is you consider three different classes of people. Susceptible individuals. So uh, let's say we have a box of susceptible individuals. Infected individuals. So a box of infected individuals. And a box of removed individuals. Uh, and we're going to have make a couple assumptions. Um, assume that the, this is the most complicated assumption, the infection rate is proportional to the number of infected people. Um, so let's say this is an arrow going from susceptible to infected. And what we're going to say is that the infection rate is proportional. So we have some proportionality constant, let's call that beta. So beta, uh, this is just some variable. It you can label it whatever you want, but in practice, um, by convention, epidemiologists, Epidemiologists usually label this proportionality constant beta. Uh, and we have the um, proportional to the number of infected individuals. So number of infected individuals multiplied by the proportion of susceptible individuals in the population. So now this proportion of separate susceptible individuals in the population where n is the total size of the population. So that is times s over n. Okay, so that is our infection rate. So that's the rate of people moving from the susceptible compartment to the infected compartment. 
Uh, and let's assume we have a recovery rate that's also proportional to um, the number of infected individuals. So here we have a proportionality constant. We normally call this constant gamma for conventional reasons. And the number of infected individuals, uh, well, let's put that in blue here again. So here we have gamma times i. And this is one of the simplest um, epidemic models. It's an epidemic model where people who are susceptible become infected uh, based on them randomly encountering someone who's infected. That's why it's proportional to both the number of susceptible individuals and the proportion of, uh, sorry, the number of infected individuals and the proportion of susceptible individuals. Um, and then infected individuals slowly recover over time. Um, uh, so, and when they recover, they become removed, and we're assuming that they have perfect immunity for the rest of time, and so they never get infected again. Obviously, you can change these parameters, and you can draw other arrows to, for more complicated epidemic models. So, for example, with some epidemics, people who've recovered still can become susceptible again over time, and so they lose their immunity. So, for example, something like COVID-19, people think to be... Uh, a more, uh, needs a more complicated model because people who are removed from the population, who recover, aren't necessarily immune, uh, fully immune. And so you'd end up with extra arrows uh, going from like S to R in order to accommodate that. But here we're just going to do the uh, basic SIR model uh, with, uh, without any back arrows. And once we've done, written out this model in this compartmentalized form, you can also rewrite it in terms of a system of ODEs. So here we have s dot, and s dot is going to be equal to minus beta s i over n, because beta s i over n is the um, uh, number of individuals who go from susceptible to infected as a function of time. We have i dot is going to be equal to, well, how many new infected individuals do, you get? do we get? Beta s i over n, and how many do we lose? We lose gamma i. And lastly, we have r dot, which is equal to gamma i. Okay, so basically, we use these diagrams to represent these uh, differential equations in an easier to understand way. Let's try it out. So. Does the following, do the following compartmentalized models correspond to the equation above? Uh, yes, no, or maybe. Uh, let me reset the chat and let me draw a couple boxes and well, let's see if uh, you guys, so let's say we have an A here and an arrow 4 and an arrow 2A. So does this correspond to uh, the uh, equation above? Okay, it looks like people are saying no, uh, and that is, uh, so no. Why is that? Well, when you rewrite this equation, you have a prime is equal to uh, minus 2a plus 4. So uh, we obviously need to swap one of the uh, arrows. So let's say that uh, instead we had um, 2a is leaving the box and 4 is entering the box. Uh, let me reset the chat before it. You answer. Okay, so um, the answer to that is yes. We have now flipped the arrow properly, and this is now um, uh, this does correspond to the model above. What if I make it slightly more complicated? So let's say I have a here, and we have b here. And we have 4 here, and we have 2a here. Uh, let me reset before anyone replies. Okay, so this one's slightly more complicated, right? And so the answer to this is, well, yes, it is complicated. Um, and it does sort of correspond to the box, because if you were to turn this into a system of equations, 
what you'd get is you get um, a prime is equal to, uh, oh, sorry, a prime is equal to minus 2a plus 4, and b prime is equal to minus 4. And so the answer to that is, well, yes, but you have an extra variable. Uh, will b eventually run out? That is a really good question. It depends on what the system is of. Um, and so in the in a general compartmentalized model, well, maybe b can even go negative. Uh, obviously, if b is a uh, model, if you're trying to model humans in an epidemic, well, b might actually run, and a is the infected individuals, then yes, b will run out, and this means that your model is bad because, or at least your model doesn't work in super long time scales because you can't have negative people. So yeah, so this is one of the things about uh, mathematical biology that you have to be careful of, which is um, math is perfectly happy with negative numbers. Biology isn't always. Um, let me try one last one uh, before moving on. So let's try uh, this one here. So let's say A, let's say I have 2, 2, A, A. And let me reset. Okay, yeah, so this one, yes, this is uh, still corresponds to the same model, uh, though um, in some cases this might correspond to um, things going into the A compartment from different sources and leaving to different sources. And so you can have complicated graphs, basically, of uh, the different connections between uh, compartments, um, and it still is a compartmentalized model. Okay, let me go ahead and have a brief aside, which is there are some notational issues depending on whether you're using the, uh, this textbook, other textbooks, or if you're looking at resources online. And uh, could that apply to, uh, sorry, there's a question. Could that apply to watershed systems? Um, it depends on exactly uh, what you're modeling, but yes, often you use these sorts of compartmentalized models for complicated systems where you have different compartments. So one classic way of using these models is when you have um, multiple tanks of water and you're mixing between them at different rates and inputting different compounds in there. Um, and that may apply to something like a watershed. Well, it depends on the exact model you're using. Um, but yeah, so there's a quick notational aside because when you are looking at these things online or reading your textbook, sometimes people use different kinds of arrows. I'm only going to use one kind of arrow, but... Um, there are historical, reason, historical and conventional reasons why people use different kinds of arrows, so just be careful whenever you're reading other resources. So your textbook uses two different kinds of arrows. They use solid arrows for relative rates, so things that are proportional to the variables, and they also use dotted arrows for constant or uh, uh, time-dependent um, uh, time rates that don't depend on the, uh, the independent variable. Uh, sorry, on the dependent variable. Um, so just to give a quick example of this, if we had this system again, so this is our pipe, this was 10, and this was s over 20, and so this is um, my notation, uh, and let's say we had uh, versus s and uh, dot 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 10, and a solid arrow s over 20. So this is the notation in your textbook. Oh, sorry, um, I messed that up. 1 over 20. Uh, and you have an implicit. Uh, I keep on swapping slides today. I'm not sure why. So an implicit s. So this is your textbook notation. Um, so. This is the promise I'll make you. Matt, A3035, 30, 30, in all of our quizzes and tests, we will use the left-hand notation of using just solid lines everywhere, and we'll explicitly say that it depends on the, uh, when it depends on the variable s, instead of having this implicit dependence and based on dotted arrows. Um, the reason that we have this uh, dotted arrow, dashed arrow notation, oh, sorry, solid arrow notation, is because often uh, when an arrow leaves a box, you want it to depend on the box. So um, the rate of things leaving a tank depends on the concentration or amount of the stuff in the tank. And so that's why historically we often, and conventionally, we often use these solid arrows to refer to things that are relative to that. And then we might have like 
dotted arrows for things that do aren't relative to the amount of stuff currently there. But for the sake of simplicity, in today's or in this class, this entire class, we will always be using the left-hand notation, and we will always be explicit about um, what variables the arrows depend on. Any questions about that? I just wanted to throw this in there in case you're reading the textbook and you're a little bit confused at the difference in notation. So I will never use dotted um, and solid arrow notation. All my arrows will be solid, and the amount I write there will be the amount. OK, so now let's try it out. Uh, so find the general solution for the following one compart for the following one compartment model. Let me write down the model. So let's say we have a variable p here. Two goes in. Zero point two comes out. And these are your possible answers. So what is the general solution for this fo the following one compartment model? Okay, so it looks like most of us got A, uh, uh, one or two people got B. So let's work this out. I deliberately chose one that was relatively easy. So P dot is equal to 2 minus 0 0.2, which is equal to 1.8. And so therefore, P is equal to 1.8 T plus C, when you integrate both sides, when you integrate. Um, now, I'm just going to work through this since uh, this other one, uh, just because it's one of the other things I wrote down. So if this was a 2 and this was a 0 0.2p instead, then what you'd have is then you'd have a first order linear differential equation and it'd be, you'd have to solve it entirely. So then you'd have p dot is equal to 2 minus 0 0.2p. Uh, and so p dot plus 0 0.2p is equal to 2. Uh, you have an integrating factor, i of t is equal to e to the 0 0.2t. And so therefore, p times e to the 0 0.2 t is equal to, uh, that will be 10 e to the 0 0.2 t plus c. And there, therefore, p is going to be equal to 10 plus c times e to the minus 0 0.2 t. OK, so that's where I got the uh, solution uh, answer c from. But there's no, um, but I just wanted to show that to you. Uh, because we will be doing, solving a lot of linear first order systems, and you should be able to do it quickly. OK, so um, let's talk about pollution. So this is an example from bidding air. This is example five in the, um, uh, on page 557. So we take a muscle. So these are these uh, fun little critters um, in the picture over there. A muscle is placed into lake water polluted by polychlorinated biphenols, so PCBs. These are bad. We don't want them. Let Q of T be the concentration of PCB in the muscle in micrograms per gram of tissue. OK, so that's some concentration. And the muscle absorbs PCBs at uh, 12 micrograms per gram of tissue each day. And the muscle is able to uh, process and eliminate PCBs at a rate of 0 0.18 Q micrograms per gram of tissue each day. So now, how do we solve this? Well, you can write out a pretty simple one component model. So let's say we have Q here. What goes in? Uh, 12. Uh, 12 goes in. What comes out? 0 0.18 Q. So what do we have? We have Q dot is equal to 12 minus 0 0.18 Q. Then Q dot plus 0 0.18 q is equal to 12. We have an integrating factor, i of t is equal to e to the 0 0.18 uh, t. Uh, when you, uh, do, when you in, because this is e to the integral of 0 0.18 dt, but that's just the constant, so it gives you 0 0.18 t. And then, uh, by using the uh, algorithm that we discussed for solving the near first order differential equations, you know that q e to the 0 0.18 t, uh, q times e to the 0 0.18 t, is equal to the integral of 12 times e to the 0 0.18 t uh, dt, which is equal to 200 divided by 3 
e to the 0 0.18 t plus some constant. Divide out both sides, and you're left with q of t is equal to 200 divided by 3 uh, plus c e to the minus 0 0.18 t. And of course, we have an initial value problem. Uh, we're assume, if we assume that it starts out unpolluted, so the muscle starts out with uh, no PCBs, uh, so that implies that Q of 0 is equal to 0. Well then, when you plug that in, you end up getting that C is equal to minus 200 over 3, and Q of T is equal to 200 divided by 3 minus 200 divided by 3 e to the minus 0 0.18 T. Any questions about that? Should we state that assumption on a quiz? Yes. Uh, if you, if I uh, put something on the quiz and you and you're trying to figure out what the initial conditions are, you should state all your assumptions explicitly. So she, you should be like, well, um, I you have to assume that the if I ask you what the uh, rate is in, uh, specifically, you will need to explicitly state, oh, well, the muscle started out with zero uh, PCBs. Um, Whenever you make an assumption, you should always state it explicitly. Okay, so we've solved a couple of these, and hopefully you're, you guys are getting a bit familiar with how to solve linear first order ODEs. You should get good at these. Like I told you with integration, there are just certain types of things that you should get really fast at. Um, I will actually be giving you a couple additional techniques for solving of, uh, linear ODEs, uh, which you can apply to first order ODEs if you want. Um, so. Um, these will be techniques that you can apply to this to make it slightly faster. But I'm here I'm using the algorithm that we gave you earlier. Okay, so that was one compartment models. What about multi-compartment models? Is that a reasonable thing to uh, talk about? Um, so, yes, we can talk about multi-compartmental models. So let's say we uh, have a variable x and a variable y. So now, one of the reasons we've started using t for time is because um, oftentimes when we're talking about multi-compartmental models or uh, systems of multiple ODEs, uh, we often use x as one of the uh, dependent variables instead of the independent variables. So let's say we have a simple uh, multi-compartmental model. So let's say that's 1, let's say this is 0.1x, and this is 0.2y. So what is the system of uh, equations? Uh, let's see, so we have x dot is equal to uh, 1 minus 0 0.1x, and we have y dot is equal to 0 0.1x, because that goes from x, the x compartment to the y compartment, minus 0 0.2y. So now there are a couple different things we might ask, but I'm going to ask the question, what are x of infinity and y of infinity? So I'm just going to ask, what's the question at time infinity? Um, and so one of the things you might notice is that the very first equation doesn't depend at all on y. And so that's just a simple, uh, that's just a single uh, first order uh, linear ODE. And so we can analyze the asymptotic stability. So let's say uh, we have uh, x dot, uh, let's say that's equal to 0, which would imply 1 minus 0.1x, which implies that x is equal to 10 is an equilibrium. Now the next question is, uh, is this equilibrium stable or not? Well, let's draw out the phase line. Let's say this is our phase line for x. Um, we have 1 here. When you plot out 1 minus 0.1x, uh, well, what you end up with is uh, you know that when when x is less than 10, uh, this is uh, x dot is positive. And when x is greater than 10, x dot is negative. And so these things all point inward. And so therefore, you have that this is um, asymptotically stable, uh, which means that at time infinity, x is going to be equal to uh, 10, starting from anywhere, uh, because all the arrows all point inward. Uh, what about for y? Well, let's say that uh, if we have uh, at time at t equal to infinity, 
y dot is equal to 0.1x minus 0.2y is equal to uh, 1 minus 0.2y because we know that at time infinity, uh, x is equal to 10. So let me write that off to the side. At time infinity, x is equal to 10. So uh, we can do the same thing for y. And so it turns out that if we solve that, you end up getting uh, y equal to 5 is uh, is the equilibrium. So y equal to 5 is equilibrium. And again, uh, if uh, y is less than 5, then you end up uh, getting pushed upward. And if y is greater than 5, you end up getting pushed downward. And so this is asymptotically stable. And what you get is that y is equal to 5. OK, so this is one way of doing, solving it. And we were able to solve this very simple multi-compartment model because we first solved for x, and then we plugged that value in for y, effectively. Um, and here, we're only plugging in the values of time infinity. But you can also do it for uh, other times. So we can explicitly solve this um, for all times uh, the same way. Oh, I need to copy my. Thing. So we have x, uh, that's 1, 0.1x, y, and 0.2y. So let's solve this explicitly uh, for all times. So again, we have our system of equations. x dot is equal to 1 minus 0.1x, and y dot is equal to 0.1x minus 0.2y. So let's just solve the uh, x part first. So we have x dot is e uh, plus 0.1x is equal to 1. And we have, uh, so then we can come up with an integrating factor. Let's call it i1 of t is going to be equal to e to the 0.1t. And so therefore, x e to the 0.1t is equal to the integral of e to the 0.1t dt. And so x e to the 0.1t is going to be equal to 10 e to the 0.1t plus let's say you call it constant one, c1. And therefore, e is equal to 10 plus c1 e to the minus 0.1t. But now that we know what x is for all time, we can plug that back in to y. So y dot is going to be, then be equal to 0.1 times 10 plus c1 e to the minus 0.1t minus 0.2y. We rewrite this, we get y dot plus 0.2y is equal to 1 plus uh, 0.1 e to the minus 0.1t. We can, again, find an integrating factor. The integrating factor here is i of t. Uh, i2 of t is equal to e to the 0.2t and plus e to the 0, uh, y e to the 0.2t. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. I'm sorry. I'm just rushing ahead. But uh, so to remind you, we're, we have we solved the x equation first. So x was a linear first order ODE. It didn't have any dependence on y. And so we, didn't, we could ignore it while we were solving from x. And then we managed to get that x of t is equal to 10 plus c1 e to the minus 0.1t as a general solution. The next thing we did is now we know what x is, we can just plug it back in for y. So because we're able to solve one of our variables first, we then plug it back in. Uh, and then we plug that in. And so then we get we plug x in here, and then we multiply out. So once we multiply that, that out, then y becomes, uh, again, just another first order linear ODE. And so we can use the exact same technique of using an integrating factor and following that algorithm to solve for y as well. And that's the step we're at here, we're, that we're at here. So y e to the 0.2t is going to be equal to. Uh, the integral for e to the 0.2t um, plus 0.1 c1 e to the 0.1t. dt. And the reason for this is, uh, so you have to be a little bit careful, e to the 0.2t 
times e to the minus 0.1t is equal to e to the 0.1t. Right? Because you can add together uh, the exponents when you're multiplying together two different uh, exponentials. So now that's just a matter of solving that. So then y e to the 0.2t is going to be equal to 5e to the 0.2t plus c1 e to the 0.1t plus some other constant c2. So at the end of the day, we need to divide both sides by e to the 0.2t, which is equal to multiplying both sides by e to the minus 0.2t, and we end up with y is equal to, uh, let's say y of t, is equal to 5 plus c1 e to the minus 0.1t, because we've divided out by e to the 0.2t, plus c2 e to the minus 0.2t. Does anyone have any questions? So the basic idea here is we can um, understand this behavior by uh, breaking by first solving for one variable and then solving for the other one. This won't always work. So um, oftentimes, if they're both dependent on each other, then you need to actually be able to solve a system of uh, ODEs. Um, but for these very simple uh, sort of linear um, examples uh, that just go forward, you can actually solve these by just solving for one variable first and then solving for another one. So let's try this out. So what is the behavior of the basic SIR epidemic model? Uh, and remember that n is equal to s plus i plus r. And beta and gamma are parameters. And let's assume that all these numbers are positive. So let's start to see that they all start greater than 0. Um, what is the final result of this sort of SIR uh, model? So does everyone end up susceptible? Does everyone end up infected? Does everyone end up removed? Or some mix of the above? Okay, so we have our first couple responses. So we have a mix of answers for B and C. So now let's think about this intuitively. If you have some disease that infects people, and then eventually those infected recover, and then once they're recovered, they're immune, at the end of the day, do people end up... Um, still infected or uh, removed? OK, so we'll, now let's actually work this out and let's solve it step by step. So the first thing to do is uh, we, we care about time infinity. So let's just uh, plot these out on the phase line. So we have s dot is equal to minus beta si over n. Well, if you set this equal to 0, then you know that the equilibrium point is 0. So s equals 0 is equilibrium. And if you look at whether, uh, so we don't care about this negative thing because that's aphysical. And so if, uh, if s and i are both positive, then this arrow points to inward. And so therefore, uh, everything goes to 0. So the limit as t goes to infinity of s of t is equal to 0. And we can do the same thing over here for i. So that was s. Let's say this is i. Well, we have i dot is equal to beta s i over n minus gamma i. But note that this is 0 at infinity. And so you end up with the same sort of behavior. So you have a 0 here, and this is a physical, and you have an arrow pointing downward. And so the limit as t goes to infinity of i of t is equal to 0. And lastly, uh, for the last one, we don't actually have to solve it, because we know that r is equal to n minus s minus i. Uh, so therefore, for the limit as t goes to infinity of r of t, is equal to n minus 0 minus 0 is equal to n. And so by the end of the day, 
everyone is removed. Now, obviously, this is a super simple infection model. And uh, for real pandemics and epidemics, uh, often there are other parameters. And so we will be talking about these a bit more, but only after we learn more techniques for solving systems of ODEs. I just wanted to introduce these to try to connect things back to biology. So a few concluding remarks. Compartmental models are a graphical way of representing rate of change of variables. And linear one compartment models we can solve using techniques for linear first order ODEs. And we, this involves either explicitly using integrating factors, or we can do a stability analysis using phase lines. Multi-compartmental models that can be broken down into a series of one compartment models are also solvable for the same reason, but more complicated multi-compartment models will require knowing how to solve systems of ODEs, which is material for a future lecture. And with that, I think I'm going to end class and start my office hours.